Hi and welcome back to the channel. Yeah, I've got a bit of a different view of the man cave this time around. And I am looking at the two movies that have scripts partly written by Robert A. Heinlein in the 1950s. We've got 1950s Destination Moon, the sequel to the 1943 movie Destination Tokyo starring John Garfield and Cary Grant. Not really. And then we move on to 1953 for a small film, 63 minutes long, called Project Moonbase. So let's start with Destination Moon. Destination Moon is a weird little film. It's a kind of mashup between two different Robert Heinlein books. The first one, Rocket Ship Galileo, is about a bunch of teenagers who get hold of an old male rocket. Male, I mean MAI, or not like a boy rocket. It has a thorium reactor engine that runs zinc as a fuel. They decide they're going to go to the moon. In it. They go to the moon, they build a moon base out of something a bit like an old Quonset hut. And they find not only evidence of an alien civilization in the distant past, but they find that there's a Nazi base on the moon as well. Now, Nazi bases on the moon are a cool concept. In fact, so cool that recent films have adopted them too. The two movies that have adopted the idea of a Nazi moon base are Iron Sky and its sequel, Iron Sky, The Coming Race. If you haven't seen these, if you want me to review these two, let me know. But Destination Moon, George Powell, at the start of his career as a producer of feature films. He made two feature films in 1950. The first one was a story about a dancing squirrel called The Great Rupert, which was directed by the same guy who directed Destination Moon, a guy called Irving Pichel, who had been an actor in the 20s and 30s and actually turned up as Sandor, the henchman of Dracula's daughter in Dracula's Daughter. But he moved on to directing B pictures in the 1940s and continued on into the TV era as well. The other influence for Destination Moon was another book by Highline called The Man Who Sold the Moon about a kind of oligarch con man who finances a trip to the moon via private enterprise. It's very kind of pro-private enterprise. It may have been the movie that ended up giving us inspirational idiots like Elon Musk but they're the two kind of things that mash up in Destination Moon. At the start of it we see a military rocket crashing as America tries to kind of catch up with the Russians and, and keep ahead of the Russians. A retired general called General Thayer played by Tom Powers decides to get an aerospace um, engineer and business owner called Jim Barnes played by John Archer to help him build a rocket to the moon because they want to get a moon base there first. They want to beat the Russians. They want to use it as a strategic high ground. There is absolutely no way to stop an attack from outer space. The first country that can use the moon for the launching of missiles will control the Earth. Along with the help of a whole bunch of millionaires, you know, the tuxedo wearing cigar smoking types and with the help of a Woody Woodpecker cartoon used as an instructional aid to explain rockets to a whole bunch of scientifically illiterate rich people. They then decide to build the rocket and travel to the moon. They decide to do this because they've decided the private enterprise is the only way to go and the private enterprise can do it better and faster and with less paperwork than getting the government to do it. Didn't turn out like that in 1969, but yeah, you know, these people weren't to know that 19 years before. So they build their rocket and they're just about to launch it when they get a subpoena sent to them saying, no, we don't want you to do that. If your rocket blows up, you're going to scatter radioactive crap all over the place. They decide to ignore the subpoena, leave early and go to the moon anyway, regardless of the potential environmental catastrophe. Their radio man comes down with appendicitis. They end up with a guy called Joe Sweeney, played by Dick Wesson. This thing is as close to the moon as it'll ever get. And he's your working class stiff who's the kind of viewpoint character for a scientifically unsophisticated audience. 
in the same way that the Phil Foster character was in George Powell's later film Conquest of Space. But Dick Wesson, I kind of like a bit more. He's kind of like a, a B-grade Humphrey Bogart in this movie, and it's kind of fun to see that when any of the other three crew members who are scientists and the general um, have to explain something for the audience, they'll explain it to Sweeney, and he'll make a wisecrack about it. But it turns out he's, he's a mensch. He really does save the day, and he does some hard things during the space flight to kind of help things out. Problem is, he also greased up the antenna, which is a retractable antenna on the hull of the thing, not knowing that in the vacuum of space, you can't put grease on something because it will jam it up. So on the way to the moon, the intrepid astronauts decide that they've got to do an extravehicular activity, get out on the hull in their magnetic boots, and ungum up the antenna. While they're doing that, one of the crew members, the only married one, by the way, accidentally lifts his boots checking the exhaust nozzle of the rocket and drifts away so they've got to use an oxygen tank as a propellant and as a jet kind of to rescue him so there's a lot of accurate science in this one as it was known at the time and that hadn't really been seen in movies before this since Frau Mond the Fritz Lang Theo von Harbu movie from 1929 so there's a big gap where cinema didn't really do many scientifically accurate looks at space travel. So this one was a bit of a breakthrough. So there's a lot of explanation in this. But you've got to remember that audiences, for the most part, weren't very au fait with the idea of rockets and spaceships at the time. So they end up getting to the moon and it's a bit of a rough landing. They use radar but the landing sites are difficult and they're kind of playing it by ear and don't have time to do calculations because calculations were incredibly complex at the time so they play it by ear and find out that they've got not quite enough fuel to get home after they do their exploring and they bounce around the moon's surface and by the way the cracked moon surface that you see in this movie was known to be scientifically inaccurate at the time but the filmmakers decided to put the cracked kind of dry mud looking surface of the moon like that because it gave a sense of perspective on on the set so that you can kind of get an idea of the distances so the cracks in the distances on the set were much smaller giving you a full sense of perspective so that's why it was done that way you also get some really great astronomical art by Chesley Bonestell the astronomical artist who was the bee's knees in the 1940s and 1950s when it came to this kind of artwork and who went on to do really great covers for a whole bunch of science fiction magazines as well in the later years. So the astronauts are in a bind. They don't have quite enough fuel to get back to Earth unless they jettison pretty much everything. So they start pulling out couch cushions and equipment and, and leaving everything behind that they possibly can. They even ultimately take out the radio. And of course, the radio was an enormous box of a thing at the time in order to get back to Earth. So there's a kind of adventure here. There's scientific accuracy to the extent you could have it at the time. The movie won an Academy Award for its special effects, and rightly so. They are done extremely well. There's a little bit of sly animation done in there to kind of add to the verisimilitude of it. And it works as a kind of prototype for many, many science fiction movies over the next 20 or 30 years. Now, leaving aside the politics and, and the fact that there's only two females in the movie, one of whom is Carstairs, one of the crew members' wife, who kisses him goodbye before they go away, and the other one is a woman called Grace Stafford, who was the voice of Woody Woodpecker. So it is very much a sausage party in this movie, which kind of dates it a little bit. Uh, the politics and the and the kind of determination and the idea of America having a manifest destiny to be the best at everything forever kind of dates it as well. The, the anti-communist rhetoric is amped up a bit because, again, this is a film from 1915 America. And if you're going to talk about going into space and, and str the strategic importance of having the high ground, you're going to get into that muddy and now incredibly dated idea of global politics don't want to enter into that on this one because I, every time i mention the fact that 
America it may not be the best at everything. I get a whole bunch of people giving me a lot of turds in the comments. And to those people, hi, thank you for the engagement. It helps the channel. But um, just to kind of summarize on Destination Moon, I like it a lot. It inspired a Nat King Cole song three years later called Destination Moon, which I really like a lot. Um, this is the Retro Sci-Fi Collection edition of it. Uh, it'd be really nice if someone like Imprint reissued this one. They've done Conquest of Space, but they haven't done Destination Moon. I've got Lunar at the door again, by the way. Um, yeah, this one is a little bit less well-defined than a nice Blu-ray edition would be. Excuse me while I open the door. I now have a cat that I've got a pet while I'm trying to do a video as well. Ah, uh, well, hang on, you want to come and say hello? Come and say hello. There she is, there's the girl who doesn't want to be on the video. You gotta get down? Okay. So anyway, just to kind of summarize on Destination Moon and she's nibbling her food now. It, it is a kind of important science fiction movie because it, it did restart that engagement with real science and real stories of potential space travel that hadn't been looked at since 1929. It uh, has that kind of scientific honesty about it and you can just enjoy the ride with the kind of bulbous helmets and the color-coded spacesuits and all of that fun stuff. You can enjoy Dick Wesson. Yeah, he's a lot less obnoxious than the Phil Foster character from Conquest of Space because he feels more grounded and slightly more realistic. There, I've got rid of the four-legged menace <laughs> all as well. So yeah, um, Dick Wesson's character really is, is grounded. Not as obnoxious as uh, Phil Foster's character was in Conquest of Space. The special effects are good. There's no visible um, strings or anything like that. And it kind of works. I mean, the, the characters are all a little bit generic, apart from obviously Sweeney. And that's pretty much to be expected because the emphasis isn't on the characters. It's not a character-based drama. It's a science-based drama and all of that kind of thing. So it kind of works in that context once you get past that initial bump of private enterprise can do no wrong and, and the possibility of an untested rocket blowing up on the pad is, not, is something that should not be considered by anybody. That kind of attitude led to Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. But anyway, leaving all of that aside, it was fun to revisit, it was fun to watch, and it is very much a, a seminal work of space travel science fiction in the best possible way. That then brings us to the next one. Project Moonbase, set in the far distant year of 1970. Uh, this one stars Hayden Rourke, who was Dr. Bellows in I Dream of Genie. Ross Ford playing um, a pilot. Donna Martell playing another pilot. And it was written by Heinlein with a guy called, and I did giggle when I saw his name, Jack Seaman. And yes, I have a vulgar sense of humour. The movie starts out in the distant future of 1970. There's a little bit of a scroll which I'll freeze frame here and show it to you. In the movie now this one wasn't made by big studio it was fairly low budget it's short of 63 minutes long it may have been a, a television pilot that then went to cinemas uh, i'm not sure but it's very much a big picture for that reason movie starts in san francisco in a very distant future where phones are cordless which is kind of a an interesting conceit with big antennas on the back of them that look like that look like the heat is an electric jug so there's mr roundtree who is an enemy of freedom he is the leader in america of the subversive bad guys from overseas who will not be named he has a plan to destroy the space station america has his plan is this 
He replaces one of the scientists who is going to go from that space station on a journey around the moon so they can film the backside of the moon and do other scientific stuff. And he has doubles for all of the potential scientists that are going to go on this space trip. He replaces the guy, Dr. Werner, with his double and sends him off to go on a space trip. Meanwhile, back at SPACOM, which is part of the United States Space Force, Hayden Rourke, as the general, has two pilots he's sending on this around the moon journey with the fake Dr. Werner. One's called Bill, played by the forgettable Ross Ford. And the other one is Colonel Bright Ice, played by Donna Martell, who was the first person to orbit the Earth. And the only reason she gets to orbit the Earth before a guy does is because she weighed less. If he'd weighed 90 pounds instead of 180, he'd be a colonel and a public hero, and you'd still be a captain. But you got the orbital flight. You got the ticker tape parades and all the rest. And ever since you've been too big for your britches. So it's a wonder they didn't just get a jockey and um, avoid the gender issues there. But this movie is uh, kind of WTF in a number of significant ways. Now, Bright Ice is kind of cute and perky in a very kind of non-military way, even though she's part of the military. She's a colonel. Um, her ex-boyfriend, Bill, is one rank below her. He's a major. So Bill, being a kind of superior male, got his nose a bit out of joint because he didn't get to go for the ride and she did. But the general wants them both because they're the best pilots to go on this trip and take the fake Dr. Werner around the moon. Now there's some interesting stuff on the space station where everybody has to wear magnetic boots because they don't bother to rotate the space station. And up and down are, are very arbitrary concepts so you get weird little scenes like this. And this to show you that this is a, an unusual place and it doesn't have any gravity. And I kind of like the way they do that. They use split screen quite well to put across the fact that this is a, a very different environment. So the science there it works well. There's a, a very embarrassing bit with the press where there's a large and very over the top female reporter called Polly Prattles. My dear General, oh how handsome you look. Who gets to ask all of the science questions that the audience doesn't know of the general and, and kind of flirts with the general and she kind of acts like Margaret Dumont on Uppers. It's a really embarrassing stereotyped character for an older woman and it doesn't work for me one tiny bit. She's there to enable the info dump about the science of not only the space station but the rocket around the moon. The rocket is equipped for landing but it's not supposed to do a landing. The fake scientist messes around and they suddenly have a, a burst of power to the engines unexpectedly and the only way to survive is to actually land on the moon which they do and become the first man and woman and russian spy to land on the moon but they've landed kind of on the edge of the rear side of the moon and they can't get a line of sight to earth to tell them they didn't crash so they've got to go and put a repeater up on top of a mountain so the the bad scientist who suddenly realizes he wants to live goes up with Bill into the mountain and they put up the repeater station and conveniently he falls down and his faceplate cracks and he dies. So you've got the man and the woman on the first base on the moon. They can't get people to them except supply rockets. So they can't rescue them for six months until they build another rocket that will be able to land on the moon. So of course this being the 1950s, even though it is 1970, they get a, a priest to marry them while they're there by televisual remote control. And then they get a call from the President of the United States, who is a woman. So there are a lot of shocks in this one. First off, you've got a female pilot who's an astronaut. Then you've got a female president. But the status quo has to prevail and they have to be married and live happily ever after up on the moon until somebody rescues them. There, like I said, there's a lot of WTF in this. The sexual politics in it is atrocious. The general actually threatens to bank Colonel Bright Ice for insubordination during this movie. Any more got that of you and I'll turn you over my knee and spank you. If you do, I'll shout the whole place down. Which is a very Heinlein thing. Heinlein was by modern terms, a very unenlightened gentleman. 
uh, who was advanced in some ways in his ideas about women, and in other ways he was woefully sexist and tended to infantilize women. Like I said, it's a low-budget movie. They do kind of okay with the sets. Some of the sets are made by sheets of corrugated plastic. There's a whole bunch of instrumentation and things. They do pretty well with not very much in the way of resources when they make this film. And I admire it for that. It's it's a shitty movie in some ways with the way the characters act and the way the characters are. But for me, the science works and the fact that they made it and the fact that they tried to make it scientifically, if not socially and kind of ethically accurate, counts for a lot. It's a, a kind of little bit of a hidden gem and it's at that front end of the modern history of science fiction set in space, particularly around the moon. You can make a direct line from Destination Moon and Project Moon Base to modern and more sophisticated iterations of space opera, such as, in particular, The Expanse. The Expanse has magnetic boots in the same way the Destination Moon does and in the same way the Project Moon Base does. Keeping it scientifically accurate is not an emphasis for a lot of science fiction out there, but there is a thread of science fiction to the, right to the modern day which treasures scientific accuracy and finds ways to tell stories of various kinds without breaching that trust in science. And I really, really like that. So these two are again of their time they're both um, representations of a important author of science fiction yeah they're dated and for some people particularly younger people they might not play as well as they do for fogies like you and i who watched the movies many many decades ago so anyway that's it for this time around thank you very much for watching if you enjoyed the video please consider liking subscribing and leaving a comment you can also support the channel by going to patreon.com slash paleocinema. And I do post written reviews on the Patreon site for Patreon subscribers only. Look after yourselves. Watch some good movies. Watch some bad movies. Watch some old science fiction movies. But also give new ones a go. Because there are good films out there. You've just got to hunt them down. And sometimes they're on streaming services. But there is good science fiction being made now. So on that note, thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you next time.